Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. My name is Chong Gang Yu, and I'm Lazarus Solik. Today, I have prepared a presentation titled "He Is Everywhere." At many CTI conferences, there is usually at least one session about DPR case for actors. It's a little bit scary that I'm the one at this conference. Typically, these DPRK sessions focus on describing new threat actors, fresh operations, or novel malware. However, that's not my focus today. This session is not a technical session. I'm going to share a short tale about Lazarus and his family. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Lazarus, the code name for the threat actor believed to originate from DPRK, North Korea. In the current city I landscape, it seems like uh, everyone is actively searching for new threats associated with North Korea. Whenever an incident occurs, North Korea frequently becomes a prime suspect, especially in cryptocurrency-related incidents. This happened in South Korea in the past as well. I work for the Financial Security Institute in South Korea. FSI provides security services for more than 200 financial companies, which means nearly all financial companies in South Korea are our members. Serving as the ISAC and CSERT for the financial sector, we work closely with the National Cyber Security Center, KRSERT, and law enforcement. South Korea's financial sector went through a challenging period, especially on March 20, 2013, known as Operation Dark Soul. Even though it has become been a decade, I still vividly recall that day. Broadcasters and banks reported breaches, and banking services were stopped for several days. I was involved in the investigation at various sites affected by Dark Soul. In addition to Dark Soul, North Koreans have been responsible for various other cyber attacks. For me, Working for a company that supports financial companies, tracking their activities is not just a hobby, it's a job that must be done. So, whenever I came across a technical post about Lazarus, I started collecting their URLs. This job has uh, continued for several years. All the URLs are publicly available. The majority of the collection consists of the technical posts with some press release from official organizations. From 29 to 2018, the number of posts each year was in the dozens. Since 2018, the, that number has been steadily increasing, surpassing 100. And in 2023, it exceeded 400. This could imply that the threat actor from North Korea is becoming more active, or it could be that CTI companies have become more focused on these actors. Here is a list of top 10 also based on the number of posts. Each post has a slightly different focus depending on the author. There are primarily two types of posts, malware analysis and incident investigation. This variation depends on the company's specialty. In other words, it depends on how they get a data. Antivirus companies can more easily collect malware samples during an ongoing attack, analyze them, and publish their findings. How However, these findings may not always be directly linked to a specific actor because it's in the middle of an attack. In the post about instant investigation, there might be clear information about the threat actor involved, and there could even be a TTP analysis to provide better insight. However, specific details of the incident might not be disclosed to protect their customers. So, commercial CTI services are also very depending on the company's focus and how they get a data. It's important to choose wisely. In South Korea, Annet and its security are focused on Mari analysis, while globally, Kaspersky, MegaP, and Trend Micro do, and KRSOT and Annet build knowledge bases based on instant investigations, and Mendiant and USGSA do so on global scale. Annet, the top-ranked company, is the leading antivirus provider in South Korea, so they can collect huge samples. Whenever there is an issue, Amnet consistently has all the samples, even when other companies might not, including VirusTotal. 
Is the security has been actively publishing for some years, but the number of posts has been decreasing recently, likely due to a key analyst leaving the company. Let's extract some numbers from the data. There are over 1,600 posts in total, and more than 300 organizations and individuals are keeping an eye on them. If you focus on the notable incident or operation that are believed to be linked to ladders, there are over 100 cases across 57 countries. When I extracted the code names that refer to the group, I found 143 in total. You might be familiar with some code names, Lazarus, Kimski, AP37, but what about the less well-known ones, such as Status Chalima, Emerald Sleep, Black Artemis, and Sharpen Shooter? And what about ITG10, ATK114, APT-Q-10? It's impossible to remember all these code names. So, someone might publish a fascinating test technical post with an unfamiliar code name. You might not even realize it's too late to a North Korean director. So, I had an idea. Let's organize all these code names. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who thought about this. This is managed by Soko, the, the organization behind this fantastic event. Also, there's something called the Select Galaxy. This Miss Galaxy cluster handles malware, threat groups, operations, and more, each as a separate node. Visualizing this data as a network graph, it kind of looks like a constellation, which is why they call it a galaxy. Since it's open source, it includes a mix of threat group code used by various organizations. When it comes to the North Korean selector, it's categorized on the selector, and if they exclude the operations, there are just over 10 groups. The MITAR tech framework is just about tactics and techniques related to the cyber attack. It also covers threat groups tracked by the CTI community. In total, there are 138 groups, including nation state sectors and cybercrime groups. Because different organizations might track similar activities under different names, might provide group IDs, names, and list of associated groups. Among these, the North Korean select group has five IDs, and there are total of 30 code names listed. For each threat group, they systemically link to the technique and software they use, which can be incredibly useful for countering threat groups that focus on TTPs. You can also find data that show connection between cyber threat actors and actual North Korean intelligence organizations. Mendiant, a leading threat intelligence company, has identified the third and fifth groups of the RGB and the Ministry of State Security as operating at the groups. They also detail how each of these connect to threat actors in the, in the community. There was an update last week, and it made a few changes. The export panel report of the UN Security Council Training Sanction Committee on North Korea has outlined North Korea cyber threat activities which were found to be in violation of sanctions. This includes trend in ransomware distribution and cryptocurrency size. The report also discusses the connection between North Korean government organizations and threat actors. Unlike Remandiant, it has been investigated that threat actors under the third blue on RGB are involved. I found several other similar reports, but the results varied. Given that North Korea is a closed country, Connecting cyber organization to real world entity isn't straightforward. So I decided not to attempt this puzzle. Let's break down how threat actors are named by different organizations. The simplest way to do this is by giving them a number with a common starting word. Many organizations follow this method. It's convenient for them to manage, but it can be challenging for people to remember. Another approach is uh, to name these actors similar to how we name malware. Kaspersky seems to adopt this approach by taking or modifying certain words from malware file names, PDB path strings, and other IOCs. Companies may change their naming conventions. For example, Microsoft used to pick names from elements, but recently they have shipped to words related to weather event. Mendiant uses different strategies. If they lack enough free evidence for a threat actor, they'll give it a UNC prefix followed by a number. UNC means uncategorized, maybe. 
When they do have enough dividends, they'll add an APT prefix followed by a number. Another way to name these actors is by using a common prefix or suffix that's tied to a specific sponsored state. These prefix or suffix often take the form of animal names, weather events, star constellations, colors, and so on. You can see with major state sponsored state actors. For the North Korean, CrowdStrike uses Cholima as a suffix, Microsoft uses LED, Palo Alto uses Pisces, and PwC uses Black as a prefix. Now, let's see how different organizations actually name the North Korean director based on their own naming conventions. Annette and KR Satos use LED as a prefix, which can be a bit confusing because PwC uses LED to refer to the director from China. So, which naming conventions do you prefer? Simple numerical systems are common, but uh, not, may, not very memorable. While using prefix or suffixes at the country level can help distinguish, but using colors can be tricky. Personally, I have a mixed feeling about Microsoft naming approach. I'm not quite sure what SLID means in the English culture, but doesn't it sound relevant to have a gemstone type in front of it, like diamond sleep or emerald sleep. It might be a bit too fancy to give such beautiful names to the bad guys. This is my version of the PRK Selector Galaxy. We have been discussing the code names for the selectors connected to North Korea. There are 143 of these sectors, but they don't all refer to the same entity, and the data can be somewhat disorganized. So I have categorized the code names into six clusters. Lazarus, Skakroft, Brunov, Kinski, Andaria, and Koni. Usually the dominant actor name in the community is the first one that gets published. I have chosen the name that multiple companies heavily reference as the representative name. I have based this cluster on publicly available data, but some code name you couldn't be categorized due to insufficient data and there may be also be incorrect clustering. Lazarus first came into the spotlight in, in February 2016 when the Noveta Group released Operation Blockbuster, a detailed white paper about the Sony Pictures Entertainment Breach. This white paper, which was accompanied by a dedicated website and included a detailed description of the breach, analysis of the malware, IOCs, and Yara rules, it was highly regarded in the community and influenced the other style white paper that followed. Lazarus is a common male name in the Hebrew culture, meaning God helped me. And there are two Lazarus in the Bible, one rich man and one who returned from the dead. The name Lazarus has been chosen because they refer to themselves as God's apostles in the Sony Bridge. Other names within this cluster include Nikkei Academy, Black Artemis, Labyrinth Cholima, Diamond Sleep, Ephron, and so on. Lazarus is sometimes used as a specific select name to distinguish it from others, but it can also represent their entire North Korean selector. This is why you might see Bruno and Andaria being referred to as a suburb of Lazarus. Skakraft first appeared in June 2016 when Kaspersky released his Operation Daybreak report. There was some confusion because the Dark Hotel Group used the same attack infrastructure. The name seems to be derived from the domain name Skakroft.net, which was used to, as a Mario distribution. Red Eyes, Group 1 to 3, Ricochet Chalima, Yankee Skid, Kim Song 1 to 1, and AP Star 7 belong to this cluster. Skakroft has been known to target North Korea detectors and expand this attack to include spear phishing and Android device. In April 2017, Kaspersky introduced Blonorop as a subgroup of the Lazarus in his Lazarus Under the Hood report. Blonorop seems to be named after Mario Fire and ROFF in the Bapi, found in the Bangladesh Central Bank Heist. APT Stories 8, Crypto Core, Crypto Mimi, JD Sleep, and Bigger Boys, TA444, are part of this cluster. Blonorop is known for targeting financial institutions, starting with the Sleep Heist. More recently, they have been focused on high cryptocurrency exchanges, 
and exploiting smart contract in web three components. Kaspersky announced Gimski in September 2013, initially announced as an operational code name, but it became a group name. It's one of the first thread actors associated with North Korea. Gimski was chosen because of the email sender's name, Kim Suk Yang. It appears to be a Russianized version of the Korean name. Other names in this cluster include Black Bench, APT43, Sharp Tong, Emerald C, Red Charima, and TA408. Gimski focuses on espionage against South Korea, regularly conducting spear phishing attacks and capitalizing on the timely social issues. So someone called them to the king of the spear phishing. In July 2017, the Financial Security Institute released a white paper about campaign rifle in South Korea, naming the actor behind them, Andrew. As one of the co-author of that white paper, I was involved in the naming process, so I you know exactly why you choose that name. The name Andrew was chosen because Lazarus is a character in Blizzard's popular game Diablo. In the game scenario, Lazarus is a falling cleric associated with the final boss the Demon Diablo, and the boss character in Act 1 of the scenario is Andrea. Silent Cholima, Nika Hayat, Don't Fly, and Onyx Sleep are part of this cluster. Andrea targets South Korea, spreading Mario using stolen code and signing certificates, and exploiting central management software. They have also target the US healthcare industry with ransomware. Kony was introduced by Cisco Talos in May 2017 as a new Red Mario type. Kony is listed as a software group in the Mitre Attack framework. However, Microsoft, Annet, East Security, and others are treating it as another North Korean threat group. Opal Sleep and Group Pisces are related to Kony. Kony primarily focuses on spear phishing targeting South Korea and it has been potentially linked to Kimski and Skakroft. Now let's take a closer look at their notable activities. Just like with the post, I've organized their notable activities by year, starting from 29. The incidents that occur in South Korea are listed at the top, while those from around the world are at the bottom. The collected posts cover a wide range of operations, but I focused on those where they successfully executed the attack, not just authentic. <laughs> I've omitted the instant where they employed a tech infrastructure like a sheet server during attack. Originally known for their DDoS attacks, their activities has been steadily increasing with the highest number of incidents occurring in 2018 in South Korea. It appears that there have been fewer incidents in recent years, but undoubtedly there are several disclosed incidents. I could not include them. Today, I won't go into specific about individual incident. Instead, we will look at the bigger picture. For each incident, I have summarized their motivation and categorized them into distinct groups, destruction, espionage, data breach, financial gain, or turning all, and supply chain. Watering all attack can be seen as a kind of a infrastructure, but also, but I will only include those that have the clear and specific purpose. As you can see, they started with destructive attacks, but it's clear that they are shifting more towards making money. Assessing the geographical distribution of the victims, it's not surprising that South Korea is, the, is at the top of the list, followed by the US, Japan, and India. It's, it feels like the entire world should be colored in because he is everywhere. And if you also include the attack infrastructure they use, the whole world might be colored, maybe. I'm still working on getting more details about these notable activities, so keep an eye on my website for additional information. As I mentioned earlier, instant investigation reports often hide detailed data to protect their customers. So it would, it would be nice to be able to do that with quantitative analysis, but Based on my own my experience, I've identified the techniques they seem to like the most. When they come to initially access, their top choice is supply chain compromise. They've been using this method extensively, starting as early as 29 with the with the DDoS attacks, and they are still using it in their most recent operation. Operation Smooth Operator in 2023. 
Supply chain attacks are often identified just before major incidents, and I'm curious to see what their next move is after operations smooth operator. There is also an ongoing investigation in South Korea, but I don't know when it will be made public. And the drive-by compromise technique might be limited to South Korea. In the past, they exploited zero-day plus player and web browsers for this purpose. But as web browsers improved their security, this approach became less common. However, South Korea still uses plugin software, which can be exploited for wording or turning attack. Just last week, Amnab released uh, its Operation Dream Match report. This report covers ordering or attack through plugin software in South Korea. When it comes to retro movement within a network, they choose exploitation of remote services. Some, some companies install agent software on all their computers, managing them from one centralized manager. I'm not sure it's only common in South Korea. In several cases, they've utilized this agent software as a means to move laterally by exploiting. Many of these management softwares, such as patch management and asset management tools, have functions for updating agents and distributing files and remote commands. These functions are often not rigorously inspected, so attackers exploit them for their own purpose. In South Korea's public and financial sectors, it is mandatory to have a gap network. However, one manager was connected to both networks, which could allow them to break into the internal networks through this manager. As organizations have improved their security, the attack surface is getting smaller. Consequently, phishing has uh, become the preferred choice for initial access. Others, along with adult groups, use phishing to spread malware and steal email service account. Once they have access to an email account, they use it to launch more phishing attacks and even leak the contents of sent and received emails. The US, NSA, FBI, South Koreans, NIS, MOPA, and others recently issued a joint security advisory about Kim's phishing attacks. Regardless of their preference, they have one remarkable skill, quick learning. They seem to quickly acquire a wealth of information to make their attacks successful. For example, in the Bangladesh Central Bank SIFT, they made fake transfers based on their understanding of the SIFT system, something only a few people in the financial company knew about. It. In the Chongwon education case in 2017, after infecting ATMs, they likely obtained card numbers and passwords by carefully analyzing various log files, which are not usually stored in the ATM. There isn't a single place that lists all code names used in the CTI community. There might be hundreds for selectors and thousands for more operations, campaigns, and malware. In April, Wired highlighted an issue related to these code names. They pointed out that those names can lead to confusion, slow down information sharing, and sometimes convey an inaccurate sense of the threat's magnitude. However, we can stop people from using code names. In fact, creating and figuring out these code names can actually help us better understand the threat they related to. Today, I have talked about the code names of the North Korean threat actors and described their activities. The North Korean threat actors are among the most active globally. They do a lot of different things, spanning from espionage, from espionage to financial gain, and even causing disruption for chaos. Predicting their move, next move is a complex challenge. The data I've shared today is a result of a, a personal side project aimed, to, aimed at closely monitoring their activities. You can access all the data on the Radars.day website and stay updated on Twitter, Mastodon, and other platforms. I'm also working on academic paper about this topic. If you work for financial companies or cryptocurrency-related business, you should know that this threat actor might already be in your systems. And if you are in the IT software vendor, you might find their phishing emails in your inbox. Don't assume you are safe. They might be using your website for the infrastructure. It's everywhere. That concludes our talk today. Thank you.